want to say thank you to all of you for being here this almost afternoon morning. We're right on the cusp. And uh, also to the Consortium of Ohio Libraries for sponsoring the pre-conference and the ECDI and Mobius for being champion sponsors for this 2021 Evergreen International Online Conference. <clears throat> Here we are on, on the internet again. And introduce to you Rogan Hamby, who doesn't really need any introduction whatsoever. But there it is. And then uh, give it to him so we can talk to you about personal identifying information on the web. And let me see if I can. I turned off my screen share, but I'm going to cancel that. Okay, are you, there we go. I'm gonna be quiet, take it away, Rogan. Hey, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. It's actually afternoon here now. So if you're in a different time zone, good morning, good evening, wherever, whenever you are. Uh, we're all time traveling on the internet, I suppose. So, my name is Rogan Hamby. I'm with the Equinox Open Library Initiative. Uh, for those who don't know me, I am a data and project analyst, which as one person once meant that I spend a lot of time punching mark records in the face. Um, not just mark records though, I spend a lot of time moving data into Evergreen from legacy ILSs, other apps and special projects, all kinds of things like that. So I spend a lot of time looking at stuff that is in Evergreen, both new and old legacy stuff. Now, this presentation comes from my affection for privacy. I, I say affection because I feel like in this day and age of people lowering their standards about expectations of privacy, that if you are too militant about it, you're almost like you're you're too likely to end up feeling like Don Quixote charging at the windmills, um, it, or or maybe better yet, you know, like a king at the seashore uh, slashing at waves with his sword. Uh, the world is becoming a less private place, but I think that as librarians, that makes it all that much more important that we fight for privacy, and that we let our patrons know that they are not a product, that we are in some form commoditizing. So I'm gonna to talk today about personally identifying information in Evergreen. We're gonna talk about what your strategies can be to make the use of Evergreen as private for your patrons as you can, which will often mean using their information and then not retaining it for any longer than you have to. And there's a bunch, some, some of this is gonna probably be pretty obvious. Some of it may not be so obvious. So we will see as we go. And I'm attempting to do something I haven't done before, which is use the presenter mode in Google Slides with the speaker notes. So this is interesting. I kind of envision this presentation as a bit of a fireside chat. Uh, we have the room for about two hours, but I don't get to see you. We're not physically there with each other. And I like to have dialogues as we do stuff. So I will warn you that there will be interactive discussion points. I will at times say, hey, what do you folks think about this? And I'll you know, name something. And hopefully we'll get more than just what I have to say. Hopefully we'll get value from everybody. I encourage you to ask questions as we go. Now, I will try to watch chat. I can't promise I'll be perfect about it. Uh, I am hoping that Ruth will, and Ruth is saying this in chat right now, that she will assist with this. Thank you, Ruth. Um, and Ruth is moderating, so we're not gonna add speakers until we get towards the end. Uh, and we have time for Q&A at the end, and then we can add speakers. But as we go, Ruth can not only ping me in chat, but also join in voice and interrupt me and say, hey, there's this good question in chat. Um, and we'll deal with questions as we go that way. And at the end, we can all share screen space and talk together, which would be great. And also, since this is two hours, I'm kind of hoping to have about a five minute break about halfway through. 
so that people can run to the restroom, grab something to drink, whatever they need to do, or just stretch. Two hours is a long time to stay still, in my opinion. So privacy is kind of a necessary problem, like laundry in my mind. I kind of want to set the stage and set expectations for this discussion. When I say privacy is like laundry, what I mean is it's something you have to constantly work at. Um, I think a universal experience of becoming an adult, or at least for most of us, uh, is that there are certain things that you just don't get to take a break from. You do laundry every day, especially if you have kids, you do dishes every day. Privacy is like that. You're going to have to look at it constantly. And I like this quote from Schneer, which kind of casts a light on another aspect of this. He said in his book, David and Goliath, data is the pollution problem of the information age and protecting privacy is the environmental challenge. And what he means by this is not only is looking after privacy something that has to happen constantly, something you need to have an ongoing diligence towards, but it's a necessary problem. It's like laundry and dishes in that regard. I mean, you need to have clean clothes and clean up after yourself in the kitchen. You need to do tasks with people's information. You need to collect it for functional purposes. And therefore, protecting their privacy is a consequence of that. Uh, in the case of libraries, we need information from people. We need their addresses in many cases so that we can follow up with them. We need to know what they checked out so that we can know when they checked it in. There are a variety of things we may need information for, and it's not going to be universal. One library may not need addresses. One library may not need um, some other piece of information. For example, I'm thinking of school libraries. School libraries often don't need an address because that's all maintained by a central student registry system, and they just need a unique ID to, keep, to be able to look that up in the school registry system. A good example of a case where you don't want that information. You don't want to duplicate it, and you, A, because why duplicate something and have a potential point of compromising privacy where you don't need it? And two, it's likely to be more accurate in the school registry system. Then again, another school may need that because they're going to generate notices and they need the information inside Evergreen. And that's going to be another theme of something we talk about. There's no universal answer here. What's true for one library is not true for another. And so when we talk about privacy, we're not talking about a set of hard and fast rules everybody must adhere to. But we're going to talk about ways to think about privacy and ways to evaluate your own practices and talk about specifics in Evergreen. This is not going to be all abstract and high concept. Now, I do want to talk about security versus privacy a little bit. Security is an intrinsic part of privacy. I mean, if somebody can get onto your system and get to the data because of poor security, obviously they can violate privacy. That's just the truth. However, this is not going to be a security presentation. Uh, I assume in the context of this presentation that if somebody manages to get into your network and get root access to your servers, if they can get privileged read access to your databases, they can stage a man in the middle attack for HTTPS to get information going to and from uh, client sessions, they can read Jabber sessions, your privacy, your patron information has been completely compromised, you're in trouble. That's not to say that looking after these things isn't important. It is. It's incredibly important. But this particular discussion is going to be about practices and concerns from an institutional standpoint. We are going to touch on a number of technical issues because you cannot completely separate institutional concerns about privacy from technology but we're not going to get into the nitty gritty of, you know, how to protect servers or how to protect traffic or anything like that. Any questions at this point before I continue on? Nope. Okay. So something else I want to say is 
in the context of us talking about privacy, I always like to say we are stewards. And I think that's important for framing things because we do live in an age where people's data is commoditized. Uh, right now, Facebook and Apple are having a big fight. Facebook is looking at potentially billion dollar uh, revenue drops from Apple cutting off their ability to track people's information. And so data is money, data is valuable, and data is valuable to libraries also. But I think it's important that we frame a discussion about patron data and saying that it is not just patron data, it is the patron's data. We don't own it. We're stewards of it. We're given it to provide services to them, and that's all. We don't have an inherent right to it, in my opinion. So I think that's an important concept to keep in mind as we move forward. We live in a world where we often hear about privacy in terms of, well, this company owns information about people. Are they, how much privacy are they willing to give that consumer? I think we have to flip that and say, how, to what purposes are patrons allowing us to use their information? So what are we going to talk about, you know, in the course of our next hour and 49 minutes? We're going to talk about the privacy landscape a little bit. There's a lot happening out there. After many, many years of governments being slow to catch on to the need to create legislation to manage privacy for their citizens, a lot is now happening and has been for a few years now. So we're going to talk about that a little bit and how it may impact you. Some of it can be surprising. We're going to talk about where personally identifying information is stored and how it's accessed. And we're going to talk about specifics in Evergreen in that regard. We're going to talk about risks associated with that storage and retrieval and options to mitigate that risk. So this isn't just going to be about, oh, no, doom and gloom. We're also going to talk about how can we make things better? How can we minimize risk? So in the terms of the order of the things, we're going to do four basic sections here. One, we're going to talk about how little information it takes to become personally identifying. We're going to talk about that legal landscape I mentioned again. We're going to think about things everyone should do. And I think we might get a couple of laughs in there and hopefully some good discussion points. And then we're going to talk about some of those technical things I mentioned, in particular to Evergreen where things are stored and where you should be looking out for potential violations of privacy. All right, let's jump in. Section one, how little it takes. This is sort of the obligatory definition slide. What is PII? PII is information that can be used to distinguish or trace an individual's identity either alone or when combined with other personal or identifying information that is linked or linkable to a specific individual. There's no reason to uh, stay on this point too long. It's a broad definition and intentionally so. Uh, some things are pretty obviously PII often. Social security numbers are a pretty famous one, but emails, names, ages, all kinds of things can be PII. And I think it's a good thing probably to have a healthy paranoia when asking yourself, is something PII? Because as we'll see, as we discuss a couple more points, it is easier to be PII than you may think. So it's data about somebody or something that can be combined with other available information to identify someone. I want to point out a couple of resources for people that I think are interesting reading. One is Latanya Sweeney's uh, working paper at Carnegie Mellon University entitled Demographics Often Identify People Uniquely. And there's also an interesting item from the Journal of Official Statistics in 1986. So this is not a new observation. They've been looking at this for a while. Finding a needle in a haystack or identifying anonymous census records. Yes. Uh, I just wanted to double check that the slides with all these awesome resources on them are going to be available after the fact so that we can read these articles and things. Yes, I okay. will be uh, after this is all done because 
you know, Google slides about, should, yeah. should persist forever, but just in case they don't, I will print out a PDF of the slides that can be moved through like slides and should have these links still working where there are links and they will be uploaded to the Evergreen website and made available on the conference page. Uh, spectacular, thank you so much. Yep, absolutely. And I, and I hope that everybody presenting will do the same. Uh, what these papers did, and Sweeney used uh, Delinius's article as part of her studies, was they looked at census records from the 1980, and then Sweeney also used 1990 records. And they looked at places with relatively low population counts. Some of them were urban, some of them were rural, but population counts, and then said, okay, let's take very minimal data. So in the census record, it says this person identified as an African-American of age 90 plus. And they were able to find them. Because when you have values, of course, I mean, this is basic statistics that are uncommon or unique in a set, it takes very little to find them. Now, this is especially a problem in our rural service areas. And anybody who's ever done outreach work, bookmobile work, anything like that, knows that there are rural service areas sometimes with maybe a handful of library patrons. And then very little data can be used to find them and attach information to their activities. And in my mind, this is a problem. Clearly. So is this a real danger? My answer is yes. Uh, looking back at that night at Le Sweeney's look at the 1990 census data, uh, she looked at five digit zip codes, gender and date of birth and found individuals, not one, not two, not, you know, small proof of concept. She was able to do it pretty reliably. And she didn't have to restrict herself to rural areas. It became very easy in rural areas. But even in urban areas, it became surprisingly easy. So you can need as little as a year of birth. And all these things I already spoke to already. Low population areas are at the most risk. Uh, rural populations are very high risk. But this is not a unique problem to rural areas. This happens in cities too, especially even in high population areas where some value is uncommon. Let's say you go geographically to a locale where a certain ethnic group is very uncommon or a certain age group is uncommon because maybe mostly younger people have moved into that area. Then suddenly those factors in the census can be used to uniquely identify them or the data in a library record. So, so why do we go over all this? Uh, a lot of people's instinct is probably that I'm nitpicking here. Nitpicking everywhere. When, when I searched Google Images for nitpicking, this showed up a whole lot. So I, I felt like it received by virtue of weight of results uh, a necessary inclusion. But I don't think I'm nitpicking personally. Uh, I don't think we're nitpicking because we need to keep data that we don't actually need out of the system. And the counter argument I usually hear from people is, but what if we need it one day? Well, my answer to that is hoarding is bad. <laughs> hoarding books is bad. That's why we have weeding policies and we weed stuff. And I'll go ahead and tell you, in, in my head of uh, reference in adult collection days, I loved weeding. Man, I would take that book card out there with a circulation history report and stuff went fast. So I'm, I'm anti-hoarding in, in most regards. Uh, my personal book collection is maybe a different story, but we're not going to talk about that. So, yeah, I think you can toss out the old stuff. If you're not a government repository uh, with an agreement to hold on to those 50 year old government pamphlets, uh, you can probably toss them. And we probably don't need those closed circ records with no fines on them or anything. What do people think? Uh, is the audience here mostly pro weeding of data? So I'm moderating, but I will say I am pro weeding of everything. 
<laughs> I, I'm the same way with, I mean, I ha was doing the collection analysis and getting my copies per capita ratios in line there. And data is one of those things. And everybody knows that if you've had a computer with some type of storage on it since yeah. forever, I mean, the photos that are on the old computers, the documents that kind of hang there when the hard drive fails, but eh, there's still data on there. I mean, I, yeah, I mean, you have to be careful of old stuff, you know, in my, my recent experience with old uh, untracked data, I was cleaning out some old boxes in the garage and found some cameras that I hadn't looked at in years and found some old photos on memory cards that were really neat to have. Oh um, yeah. And, and, that, and that, that's a happy discovery of sort of untracked data. But if you allow things like patron records or patron circulation information to become un because it's in a report somewhere, and we'll talk more about that later. That's well, a, that's that, an unhappy way of tracking, untracking that. And, and that's the thing too. And Bradley has a point here, walking the tightrope between privacy and keeping enough for robust reports and stats. Yeah, absolutely. So we can spot those trends and things. And, and it's important to keep in mind, uh, Jonathan makes a good point. It depends on the data. And this definitely goes back to the point that I made earlier about there's no answer for everybody. Um, I, I will give you an example from my routine work. Uh, I frequently migrate libraries that have some sort of statistical category, or at least what we in Evergreen would call statistical category, with gender information. Uh, obviously, in today's social environment, that is a sensitive topic. We don't usually need it. I usually encourage libraries to let me not migrate it. However, I worked with a library uh, in the not too distant past who said, we receive certain grants and we don't like it, but the grant committee and their big grant for us requires gender information. Okay. Well, I mean, they have made a legitimate choice. They've thought about it. They thought about getting rid of it. They've determined they really do need it. And so I'm not going to say they made that they're doing something wrong. That's all anybody can do is look at something and say, do we really need this? Not hypothetically, not maybe, you know, if the stars align and, you know, the seas rise and that kind of stuff, but they really do need it right now. So let's see, Jessica. You got that. Yeah, uh, we do some digital repository. This is Jessica Wolford. She says we do some digital repository stuff and I always try to discourage people from uploading yearbooks because of potential issues. Yeah, and, and that's that's a rough issue, actually, I think, because yearbooks can be an extremely valuable resource um, for research. Uh, journalists use yearbooks all the time, but what is the value? And you have to look at that in your collection and make an evaluation for yours. And obviously, you've probably done that already and decided it isn't worth the potential risk. But I can see another library saying we have a lot of journalists that use our collection and it is worth it for ours. Um, I was watching a documentary a couple weekends ago on Netflix about the Son of Sam murders and some interesting things discovered thanks to yearbook resources about uh, potential collaborators and those crimes. So you don't win. The <laughs> I, I, Jessica said that she doesn't win the argument often. Uh, I, I think we all know that feeling very well, especially when it, when that's part of what makes us feel like Don Quixote sometimes charging at those windmills, right? You know, if you hold the banner aloft saying patron privacy and the people around you have different viewpoints than yours, then it can be frustrating. But I think it's important that we keep that up. I would say too, there's a, there is in the spectrum that, as I think of most things as a spectrum, uh, where we have everything anonymized and or private, and we have the wild west of everything over there and everybody gets to dig through whatever that pile of stuff is. And then kind of us in the middle, as we are not just weeding, but then also curating that information and deciding, okay, this is stuff I probably am never going to use, but I can't say for sure. So I'm going to put it in this place with these kind of protections on it. 
and then this is stuff I'm probably going to access a little bit more frequently, but it still needs to be really um, sequestered from yes. people unless they have certain permissions and all that. So, yeah, the year. <laughs> okay, let's get into the legal landscape now. Now, uh, I, I'm one of those strange people that find laws fascinating. I actually enjoy reading on, about the laws being passed in different countries. Uh, and I intentionally am going to keep this non-US centric. And you'll see why shortly, even though a lot of us here are from the US and Canada, I think it's very important to look outside our borders. Uh, and I think by the end of it, you may be thinking of Shakespeare's line of kill all the lawyers. Uh, the, the, now the character that says this in the play I'm suddenly doubting myself. Was it Richard III? Anyway, um, he was not a nice person. So it's not meant as something that we should probably empathize with too much. Uh, but all the liabilities out there can pile up and make you think maybe we would be better off in a world of anarchy without laws. I don't think we would, but I can understand the temptation to think that. So... The danger of PII in your system is very real. What's next? Look, we're going to talk about these laws that are being passed and your obligations, but I do want to stress that I believe these are baselines, not goals. If you come into it looking at them saying, we're compliant with the law, we don't have to do anything else. That is a factual statement. You don't have to, but you should stop and ask yourself if you should. Now, you do have to balance things. You may look at something and say, we really should do this task, but we don't have the resources and the threat of this information, identifying somebody or ever getting you know, disclosed is extremely low. And so you may make a rational decision to not follow up on that. Uh, but you should stop and ask yourself if those things are true. So we're gonna start with Canada. Uh, this website, priv.gc.ca, has some information on Canada's legislation involving privacy. They have a Privacy Act that's fairly comprehensive, but only applies to their federal institutions. Like the United States, Canada ha is broken up with provinces and territories with their own distinct governance. And those governances, like in the U.S., states have a fair amount of autonomy and have laws that govern them. However, there is a federal, I'm not sure if I should attempt to pronounce this PIPEDA or not, but the P-I-P-E-D-A, Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. This applies to private organizations and it is federal. Now those provincial and territory governance bodies may have additional laws on top. And this is gonna be an important difference with the US. Uh, they have, local laws, but they do have a federal law on top. The federal law has a number of exemptions, but you need to know those if you're operating in Canada or providing information to Canadian citizens. And that, I don't know off the top of my head if it's extraterritorial ter or not, um, but I know that if you're providing services to a library in Canada, PIPEDA definitely applies. Now, the European Union has the GDPR, the General Data and Protection Regulation. This has been kind of a global standard to date. It's been around for a good few years now. I provide a link to it. And one of the things I want to stress about it is that it is extraterritorial. That means that if your services target people in the you don't have to be supplying services to an EU library. You don't have to be in the EU. But if you have a user base in the EU for some reason, this applies to you. Now, how granular is that? Ultimately, that's up to the courts. But could you potentially have a scenario where a Parisian exchange student comes over to the States stays for a couple years, gets a local library card and keeps that card for certain services and go 
goes back to Europe and an EU court would find that your practices fall under the GDPR? Yeah, absolutely. The GDPR is evolving. It has not remained static. I don't think that particular scenario was terribly likely to happen. Uh, the courts have been so far pretty reasonable in their interpretations, but it is explicitly extraterritorial. So if a European citizen uses your services, you do, in theory, fall under this. Well, a citizen of the European Union, I should say, not necessarily all of Europe. China. This is a fascinating one coming around. This is still in draft, the Personal Information Protection Law. It is modeled partly on the GDPR. It does have some differences. One of the big differences being that it is vaguer. It provides a lot of specifics as examples and things it explicitly permits, does not permit as guidelines. The PIPL is extremely vague, and that is meant to make it adaptable to many situations which give the Chinese courts a lot of leeway in interpreting it. And it is also extraterritorial. Any Chinese citizen who uses your services, according to the Chinese law, has the PIPL protect their privacy on your system. And you have to conform to its standards. Again, a single citizen who comes by and gets a library card, I, I doubt you're going to face a lawsuit in a Chinese court. But in theory, you could question about this sure um and this is this is just a thought question so say uh something happens and y this information does make it into a court mm -hmm. uh and somehow your at your database of information uh, comes under a subpoena request. Mm -hmm. I guess the, the thought in, in my mind, it's, it's I, not even so much a question, is that this could potentially end up compromising the privacy of others. Right. Now, the uh, something I have not touched on so far is the ability of these courts to enforce their rulings. True. It is a big step from a Chinese court to say, hey, you, the state of Indiana, provide us a copy of your Evergreen database in plain text. Of well, course. they directly have no ability to enforce that. Right. They would have to come to the United States and ask the United States federal government under whatever agreements exist between us mm -hmm. to have the U.S. government enforce that. Oh, absolutely. Um, and... Obviously, you know, federal courts are going to be extremely unlikely to provide wide reaching uh, overstep uh, of that kind of scope mm -hmm. uh, to a foreign entity. But, but if, yeah, and, and if it's not say, just China. I mean, also, I'm just right. thinking any of the, these laws where we kind of skirt close to the, the edge, kind of cutting corners or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, do potentially open us up to that kind of what if scenario. And that... a lot of a lot of this depends on the socio political landscape. Mm -hmm. You know, right now I find it very hard to imagine that a European court would ask for say, come to the state of Indiana and say, oh, provide sure. us all the information you have about every European citizen in your system. Of course. Now, that scope is probably reasonable, hmm. especially if a lawsuit has been filed in a European court. Right. I don't think the, Euro the U.S. courts are going to find it very high priority to uh, uh, push that along to the state of Indiana. However, if the sociopolitical landscape alters and intellectual property and privacy concerns become much higher between the two countries right. and more mechanisms come into existence to freely move that information back and forth, that could change. The, the other thing too, is that while though it may not even get to the point of 
here's this text file of these things. But litigation is not cheap. And, no. <laughs> and so even if it doesn't end up compromising patron data at some point in some respect, it could compromise the integrity of your organization right. from a budgetary standpoint. And so, I mean, it, it does sound a little chicken little, Right. About, and, but at the same point, these things have happened to individuals and organizations. So Sure. And we live in a life now where there are entities out there uh, uh, that have a very different profile than libraries generally do. Things like app makers, game makers, things like that, who are making decisions to, for example, not sell their software in a given region of the world because they don't want to deal with falling under those laws. Because not only is litigation expensive, but the form of litigation can be extraordinarily challenging. So for example, if um, China were to come after you for some reason, you would need a Chinese law expert. You would need to hire lawyers in China to fight that case, which provides a whole other level of complication. Um, so again, the threat to libraries of extraterritorial requests for your information, I think, is incredibly low right now. But is it a landscape that you should be keeping an eye on just in case things change in the future? Yeah. It is something to be aware of. And could I see a court saying, hey, you know, we're a, a court in Belgium and this guy has filed a request to get information from the state of Indiana for, you know, the, his daughter's records while she was a student in the U.S. Yeah. Is that likely to be enforced by the U.S. government right now? No. 20 years from now? Maybe. And, and we have seen GDPR affect evergreen development. Um, sure. It, in that... Uh, I think it was the geographic proximity thing as we're doing discussions sure. about that. Um, and we do have people who are organizations that fall under that, that law, even though it's, it's extraterritorial, I mean, they're in the territory. And so this impacts right. their day to day. And so they wouldn't be able to use those features as we had been talking about them because it requires the um, essentially the opting in, for every patron to use a certain part of that to make the feature work. Right. And so we went away from that to right. avoid developing in a way that would bump up against the GDPR. Yeah, and we have to be very aware of these things now. Mm -hmm. Currently, our major user, user base is in North America, but we do have users around the world, and we do want to be reasonably aware and I say reasonably aware because, you know, I, I can't invest the time to become an expert on, say, India's privacy laws. I can't invest the time to keep up with every ruling in Chinese courts about, you know, the implementations of the PIPL. But to the degree that we can, we should be aware of these things when we talk about development and features and all these things. Uh, now, let's talk about the U.S. a little bit. There are a few federal laws and regulations that apply to federal entities, let's say the Library of Congress. But otherwise, we don't really have any federal standards for privacy. Each state and local government has been told to make their own, and they have, or lack thereof. And one that is worth pointing out is the CCPA, the California Consumer Privacy Act. A link to it is here. It is generally, it is still in draft, by the way. It has not been finalized. It's not been voted into law yet. But a lot of other states are looking at it. And a lot of other states are looking at taking it as basically a template to make their own state laws. So I do think it's worth going ahead and looking at now and then being able to say in the future, okay, here's this law that does affect me. Was it modeled on it? What's different about it? Because there's going to be enough small points that it's worth spending some time with. Now, one thing about the CCPA is that it is a little different from, say, the GDPR. The GDPR and the PIPL uh, for European Union and China, they both are basically framed as a set of thou shalt nots. 
These are things that entities cannot do with patron information. Uh, do I need to pause a second? I see some folks are having audio problems. Um, I'm going to send a, a message over to okay. Brandon real quick. Okay. I'll keep going then. Uh, but the California Consumer Privacy Act is very different in that it defines things as a series of rights rather than what entities cannot do with information. It says what citizens have a right to. And it's pretty vague. And it's intentionally vague so that it doesn't get outdated quickly. And we'll have a maybe funny list of some things that have become outdated in PI and privacy uh, documents in just a little bit. And it does have many exemptions. And this is one of the things you're going to want to look at in all of these privacy laws is where there are exemptions. Some of them have exemptions for nonprofits, exemptions for organizations of certain size, exemptions for all kinds of things. For example, the CCPA uh, yes, it really does kind of put the screws to very large entities like Google and Facebook. But if you're running a small business that's not generating millions of dollars in revenue a year, you're probably exempt from all of its requirements. And there's a good chance libraries may be too. However, it's also extraterritorial. Like a lot of the other laws we've been looking at, it says if you're a California citizen, we don't care what server has your information where in the world um, our laws apply to you. Is the audio working out at this point? Dog in the background. Yep, yeah, my dogs are uh, <laughs> very unhappy, probably at a squirrel on the deck or something. So it's it's working here and, okay. and I see that it is for some people, but not okay. everybody has been in. Okay. <laughs> You'll have to read Brandon's comment yourself. I can't translate it properly. <laughs> Chinese law approved. <laughs> uh, yeah, it, it, I'm not going to get into issues about, you know, theories about what may or may not have been done by non-U.S. entities with hardware. We're not going to get into that. <laughs> okay, so at this point, I think it's easy to feel like you. it's time to put your head down and just like, what can I do? You know, all, all these entities are setting up laws all over the world that I may in theory uh, have to comply with, uh, although actual risk profiles probably really low in a lot of cases. Um, and the answer is you need to be proactive. So my experience with this, I, I will tell you, I was working at a, a county library in South Carolina in South Carolina, the library systems are mostly county-based rather than municipalities. And there was, we found out after the fact that the local county government had created new rules that all the in, county entities had to adhere to regarding privacy. And when I found this out, I asked, well, when is the implementation date of this? And they said, well, it was months ago. And I said, did you get provide notice? They said, yeah, we had workshops. Everybody was invited. Can you show me? They left the library out. And as I talk to libraries, this is a common refrain I hear, that they're often left out of these discussions. So you need to be proactive. You need to find out what's going on. You need to talk to your attorneys if your library has someone retainer and make sure that you are following the baseline of what you have to do. Now we move on to section three, things everyone should do. Now, we're about 45 minutes in. Are people still feeling good? Does anybody need a break at this point before we start the next section? One, we're gonna go on a count of three here. I'd say, I'd say go ahead and go right. through the next section, maybe a break after that. Sure, we'll see where we stand on time. Cool. So a best practice uh, is to only expose the information you need for a specific task. This, this is a specific point that I kind of wanted to call out for people to weigh in. What function do people think occurs in a library that violates this principle that you should only ex 
expose what you need for a specific task. And we do it over and over and over and over every day. What is our... I will say what I think for me is definitely the checkout because it opens a whole patron <laughs> account. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, that's... And Martha says the same, checkout. Yeah. Well, I agree. Uh, the circulation desk. The horror show right here. Um, and going back to that Bruce Schneer quote, privacy concerns are the environmental waste of our modern work. Why do we expose so much extra information? Well, we do it because we don't know what patrons are going to come up with. We do it because we find ourselves in these workflows where people expect to come up to a circulation desk and have to be able to handle as many problems as possible for them. And if they find somebody who can't handle a problem, like say voiding a fine or something, they tend to get upset, right? I mean, Absolutely. I, 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 I mean, presume most of us have worked the surf desk at some point. Well, <laughs> and, and it, we say check out and that's mostly what people are doing, but they're like, oh, while I'm here, I can also renew all these things. And hey, I just moved and I got a new cell phone number. And right. can you, yeah. And this is the environmental waste of our circuit of our circ desks. Um, in theory, it'd be nice to break everything up, but people expect it. So that person who comes up to the desk to check a book out, in theory, that person should only be checking books out and should not have access to anything that does not require checking books out. But is that practical? For most of us, it's not. And we'll talk more about that as we go on a little. So step one of all this was the first thing you sh everybody should do. And the first thing everybody should do is have a privacy policy. You need to make sure it conforms with whatever the rules of your governing bodies are, municipal governments, county governments, whatever, state governments, uh, have a policy. And where do you go to start making a privacy policy? Well, you can start with ALA. ALA has some interesting information for this. Now, this page that I'm in here, uh, you can also search for it by just doing like ALA privacy policy. I think you'll probably find the link pretty easily. It'll give you information for helping to create a privacy policy. And for the most part, it's pretty good information. Um, but I'm gonna tell people, don't just create your policy and let it sit in a file drawer or as a site on your web page. You need to make it a part of your technology plan. Because one of the good things LSTA has done in the United States, and I'm assuming that other countries have similar approaches, is that when they fund your technology, they don't just say, give us a technology plan that's good forever. They wanna see it periodically revised. And I tell people to make privacy policies part of their technology plans because even though there's an institutional concern that's not technology specific, it helps ensure that you will revise it periodically because you're gonna to have to revise your technology plans because technology changes. And many of those technology changes will also impact privacy concerns, of course. So that's just a simple way to help, you know, kind of give yourself a little bit of security there. So it's harder to forget. Now, I, I do want to say that there's a lot of information on that page and maybe not all of it's good. There are two areas that I think the ALA page has really good input on. And even if you already have a privacy policy, it may be worth looking at these and going back to your policy and saying, is there anything additional we can pull in? Assuming you haven't, you didn't use it as part of the process to begin with. And one is what to audit. I think their list of what to audit is pretty good. And the second is questions to ask. Because all of this is about questions. You know, we've talked about maybe not keeping this information, uh, say, for gender works for most libraries, but not another library. Uh, we've had several folks in chat, you know, mention depends on the data. Yeah, all those things are true. And the only way we determine whether these are things we keep or not, or how long we keep them or whatever, is by asking ourselves a series of questions. And I think the ALA 
page is pretty good for that. But there are some bad there. And I considered just glossing over this and not mentioning it. But I had too good a laugh when I was rereading it this past weekend. So I decided to share it. And this is an underscore. It goes back to my statement about making your privacy policy part of your technology plan so that you have to revise it. The ALA page mentions some specific technologies as privacy concerns. They list them specifically as emerging technologies. Um, and this underscores how that page probably needs to be refreshed. So its emerging technologies include smartphones. This was published in 2014, by the way, seven years ago. We could probably debate if smartphones were still an emerging technology in 2014, but they weren't as pervasive as they are now. RFC, which better for 2014, but its use has increased. Social networks, definitely not an emerging technology at this point, but does have legitimate information that you should be concerned about. And people post on your Facebook pages, uh, things like that. I mean, that is potential information you want to track. And this next one hurt a little bit. I'm building up drama. You know, imagine a drum roll here. Interactive OPEX as an emerging technology in 2014. What? I really, you know, I, I want to say interactive OPEX weren't, <laughs> you know, cutting edge in 2014. Um, wow. But it All is right. something to legitimately think about. And I got a last one. This one was my favorite. Software. I'm just going to let you let that sink in. They listed in 2014 software as an emerging technology. I just can't with that, Rogan. I just can't. Now, they actually called them apps. But, you know, before, before you say, hold on, hold on, you could make an argument that apps were an emerging technology. Let's look at how they defined it. And this is in the document. Quote, a piece of software or a program, typically small, that can be used on a computer, smartphone, or tablet. So software that can be used on a computer, smartphone, or tablet. They used the actual, like, what it is to, it defines itself. Right. Um, okay. That's, and it, no, examples okay. they gave are Keyring, Foursquare, Evernote, and Pinterest. They used Foursquare in 2014. It was it was around. I think it was pretty much gone by. I was going to say emerging. But yeah. Um, so if you go to that page, you see the emerging technologies. You cringe. Um, don't discount the value of the rest of the document because of that. Uh, I, I do think it has some good information, especially if you are creating a privacy policy for the first time. Okay, step two of things that we should all be doing. You have your policy. Now you need to create a procedure for handling disclosures. Um, disclosures are a real danger. Now, there can be good disclosures. We are going to use your information to improve services. This could be with, say, a third party. For example, hey, we're using this new messaging app, and we're going to share information about you with this messaging app to keep you really up to date on things happening in the library. That can be a good form of disclosure. Or, hey, we're going to aggregate your information um, to provide reports to our funding agencies to let them know where we need to build new branches. Or we're going to use demographic information about you to show that we need to build a Spanish collection or a Vietnamese collection or whatever. So those are good forms of disclosure. You're using their information and you're improving things for them. Some people think disclosure means, oh no, the sky is falling, something horrible has happened. No, disclosure needs to also include those things that you are using the information for legitimately to improve services. The bad. This is where people think about, you know, data breaches and things like that. Congratulations. You know, your patron circulation records are now available on black market websites uh, where they can also get the emails of celebrities 
Although the circ records are presumably a lot cheaper and probably being bought with stolen credit cards. But hope this doesn't happen a whole lot, but it does happen. I know of libraries that have by ransomware and we don't know for fact or not, but the ransomware may have accessed privileged information about patrons and records. So that is something to consider. And here, in the context of this presentation, we're mostly talking about Evergreen and ILS data, but this could include emails and all kinds of other things. And then there's just the ugly form of disclosure. I'm, I'm using this as an example because this has actually happened at a library I worked at. A circulation staff member was related to a patron and then told that patron's spouse that the person was checking out books on divorce. Now, this isn't a technological breach. This is the circulation staff member had access to information they did not need for that transaction, like we just talked about. Uh, so that's not a security breach because the library made a reasonable decision for their operations, for the workflows they needed to make that information available. But as Chris mentioned in chat, that is an ethical and I would argue also a moral breach. So for having a policy and a forum for handling disclosures, I think you also need a component of staff development. I think you need to teach staff to handle information with care, to make them understand that they are stewards of patron information to use with care, and to teach them, sure, go into a patron's record to help them. Don't go digging for anything you don't need, and that it is important that they hold patron's information as a responsibility. So step four is ensure that you audit and review periodically. I, I know I probably sound like I'm just beating this drum on this review periodically, but I so frequently see library security policies that somebody made years and years ago and have never been looked at again. I saw one not long ago where they specifically mentioned technological concerns they'd used. They had since migrated to an open source solution and they wanted to know, they wanted questions answered about the ILS and uh, these elements of their security policy. And it's like, they don't apply. These are too specific to your old ILS. You need to update. And I see some folks in chat are mentioning some other uh, privacy concerns related to the checkout desk. Yeah, been there. It's, and I will tell you that in my time of being a branch manager, that there were many times I had very angry parents talking to me and I was like, you know what, if you wanna know what your child checked out, you need to ask them. They're a teenager and you do not have automatic access to their account here. And that was true for our library. Uh, at 13 and under, we would supply parents with information about their children's account, but 14 and up, nope. And that was in your policy. Is that correct? Yep, that is correct. Yeah. I mean, that that is just an a, invaluable thing for your staff because otherwise that, it becomes a confrontation at the circulation desk. Right. And that was based on we had a policy of um, and actually I misspoke. I just said 14 and up. It was 13 and up. Our policy was that if you were not a teenager yet, so 12 and under, a parent had to sign for a card for you and they were your guardian. And they were essentially the holder of the account. But our policy had been 13 and up, you could sign for your own card. So when we created a privacy policy, we said, if you have your own card, that is your information and nobody else has a right to it. And if they had a guardian on their account when their card was created, we remove that when they hit 13 and it's considered their account exclusively. Brings up a question about uh, fiscal responsibility. That is a difficult area that we yeah. had to, yeah, that was difficult because we, you know, I, 
that's a quagmire. Let's not get into it. It is. I and I and I don't expect to like go into a conversation about it or anything like that, other than yeah. to say that that really does exist. It because I personally am somebody that will guard a juveniles or adolescents information until my dying breath. Mm -hmm. And then there's this bill that needs to get paid yeah. and it's got an itemized list and, and that, that kid is not responsible for the monetary aspect of it. Right. I mean, somebody said they could get a card. They're taking financial responsibility for that. Right. How, what do we do? That is not the conversation for today, but it is worth thinking about and talking about because yeah. it does come into this, this category of stewarding information and when, yeah. how, how we handle that. So. And deciding retention of information, we'll talk about retention in a little bit, but yeah, when you talk about the fiscal element, that adds a whole other level uh, of discussion that has to be taken into the policy. Yes. Okay. So section four is Evergreen itself. We're right at the one hour mark. So we're exact. I did not. We're exactly on the time I had planned. So I'm very happy with that. Um, do people want to take a five minute break real quick? I say, are we, we're getting ready to get into like the database and stuff to look where things are stored. Yep. Is that correct? That is um, correct. My recommendation would be a five minute break just so we can kind of context switch a little bit. Sure. Okay. Let's start again at 106, grab coffee, use the restroom, whatever. And we will start up again at 106. Spectacular. Thank you, Rogan. And I'm going to do the same. So I'm going to step away for just a moment. All right, I am back. Feel free to chat in the text chat. Hopefully this section has not been too dull for people more interested in the nuts and bolts of where Evergreen stores stuff. But we'll be getting into plenty of that shortly. Here.
hopefully I'm speaking at a decent pace for our captioner. Um, I, by habit, tend to be a fast talker, and I'm trying to speak at a more deliberate pace and not try to turn this into a race for the captioner. Okay. Okay, this is 106. We're going to start again. Good. Um, evergreen itself. Nuts and bolts. Our biggest risk again. Um, circulation desk. Yeah. Circulation information. Patron information. This is... Our big hole. This is the black hole that we try to avoid, but it sucks us in anyway in terms of risk. But the truth is that Evergreen is not unique in this regard. Every ILS has this problem because every ILS needs to support that same single point of workflow where people expect to come up to the circulation desk and get help for anything. However, one place that Evergreen does have an advantage over a lot of ILSs is that we have some more granular permissions. Now, this is just a screenshot of the permission administration screen, but let's talk specifically about taking advantage of that. Now, it can. this is going to be a project. Let's just be honest. Anytime you start talking about adjusting circulation workflows and mapping out new permissions, possibly creating new profile groups, you're, you're going to have to start creating flow charts. You're going to start the spreadsheets. You're going to need to pull in stakeholders from administration, circulation, and it's going to be a whole project, right? That's just the reality. Don't do it trivially. And you may part way through go, this isn't going to work. <laughs> We're going to have to keep it wide open, which is not perfect, but, you know, that's the reality we live in, right? Uh, uh, at, least a at least a privacy issue that you know the dangers and consequences of and you're prepared to deal with, uh, but you can't take active steps to mitigate is better than one that you're unaware of and will blindside you. So if you look at something and see that it's not practical to make changes, that is still better than just ignoring it. But sometimes you can find some solutions. So let's look a little more granularly. These are some of the view permissions for seeing information about patrons that are relevant. Uh, view hold, view user finds, view user transactions, view user themselves. Now, the view user is kind of a huge hole because we group information about the user onto a relatively few number of screens. I could theoretically see a world where, you know, we break address information out and have a different permission for that, uh, where we break other kind of information such as, you know, birth name and birth date and stuff like that out. All of that would require significant work. None of that is trivial to implement at all. Uh, but as a community, if we start looking at this, perhaps we'll decide we want to. But now, what's the downside? That's, that's what you always have to ask. Is this actually doable or are we doing that nitpicking, charging at windmills thing? Is it practical to actually have one staff member check books out another handle fines, and another update addresses? And that's a good question for everybody here. Has anybody here tried to implement something like that? I do know of one library that implemented something like that, where they had just simple checkouts, library aides doing that, who could not view the rest of the account. And if somebody needed something like an address change, they had to go back to a main desk. That did not last very long, I'll admit. It had a number of workflow problems and they ended up having to abandon it. But I thought it was a noble try. Has anybody here done that or looked at it? We 
We have CERC permission groups that are set up to allow our member libraries to potentially do that. There has not been a lot of pickup for it for exactly the same uh, right. reasons that you describe. From my less of my experience, I mean, my experience plays into it, but then also my observation in the years since I've been at a public service desk mm -hmm. uh, is that there really needs to be an overall look at those workflows beforehand. Um, that it doesn't, because it doesn't only affect those uh, limited CERC staff, uh, it, it affects everybody else. And so there needs to be some understanding and some buy-in from the others that it, it may change the way that yeah. they are interacting. It's gonna, the, the balance, that load's gonna land somewhere. And does it make sense to patrons and does it make sense to staff? And that that's a, that's kind of high level uh, planning as far as how people move through the library and act. Well, so. and there's a, there's a simple barrier of resources sometimes. Too. Um, oh, absolutely. I, I, I will <laughs> tell you at one library I looked at, I looked at implementing this and it was almost possible. But the biggest problem was, was that to do it in a way that made sense with patron flow through the space, which wasn't an aesthetics feng shui kind of thing. It was a, if patrons are going back and forth the wrong ways, people can't leave the children's, you know, workroom kind of problem. Yeah, and there aren't <laughs> so enough I mean, staff often to accommodate yeah. that. Well, and that was the other part. I mean, we had, we needed essentially another desk that would take up space that we didn't have. And we needed at least one person at each desk. But there were many times we only had two people, which meant that that during that time, we couldn't afford for anybody to call in sick you know, leave to go to the restroom, anything, which meant that during many hours, we'd have to essentially double circulation staff. So it just wasn't practical. To say, and Jessica, uh, Chris points out this fairly obvious thing that we, we like to say a lot, permissions are a lot to deal with. I was actually dealing with something this yeah. morning. I'm like, oh my gosh, here we go. Uh, yeah. But Jessica says, unfortunately, that means they need kind of access to all the information and limited access to items yeah. in collections, but then also they do try to limit what catalogers can do and use the secondary permission groups and things like right. that. And that's basically what we've been able to do in Evergreen Indiana as well, is we can limit our catalogers from that. Of course, they don't really care about it anyway. Um, well, some, I guess, I'm sure probably do, but. But it, there are libraries where catalogers need circulation permissions. Yeah, it holds yeah. related issues. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes we add those ad hoc and sometimes we do it as a secondary yeah. permission group or even as a part of our cataloging permission group. Right. Again, and so we always <laughs> come back to this idea of it's not one size fits all. Um, we can come up with, I mean, nobody has done this to this point of come up with an authoritative for evergreen best practices document for permissions. Um, it'd be interesting to do one but there would have to be, you know, in really big, bold letters, a caveat of this may not work for you. Yeah. Yeah. And somebody mentioned in chat about a uh, small library and a cataloger also works a circulation desk. You could split up that into different accounts. Is that really worthwhile? That sort of thing. Yeah. So let's get into the actual storage of stuff now. We primarily store information about patrons in the schema actor. For those who aren't familiar with database speak, a schema is basically a container. You can think of it as a folder with a whole bunch of spreadsheets in it. And tables are the spreadsheets. Uh, tables do have, unsurprisingly, tabular data in them, which look a lot like spreadsheets, where you know we'll have a column for something like first given name, column second given name, column family name, and so on and so forth. And we're going to talk about these and what's stored in them. So actor.user is the big one. That is the one that has probably the single highest concentration of patron data in it. It includes usernames, their family names, their birth dates, these days preferred names, surnames, email addresses, phone numbers, 
And it just goes on and on. All this stuff is personally identifiable. And a lot of it is very obviously personally identifiable. I mean, names exist for the very purpose of identifying us. Emails are by definition unique. Phone numbers are by definition unique. So the, the risk of this data being publicly available or available is fairly obvious. But there are some fields that are maybe less obvious, and I want to spend just a moment looking at these. One of, the, one of these is the ident values. These are the identification values. Uh, they don't have to be used. Originally, I think there was a conception in Evergreen that there should be some sort of validating uh, piece of information that should be in there. But you'd be surprised what I found in there. Um, I've, I have found social security numbers in there. Driver's licenses are less aren't as bad as social security numbers, but there's still something that we should ask ourselves, why are we storing this? Um, I have found, oh man, you wouldn't believe the stuff I found in ident values. And the question is, what function does it actually serve? Is it actually, is this a, if you're storing a driver's license number, do you actually have the resources or workflow to call up the DMV and validate names and addresses by driver's license number? Yeah, we, Probably, we have a lot of legacy stuff too. Yeah. That migrated in, in um, some cases. So another field, photo URLs. Now, I don't know how many people are using these. Uh, historically, this has been available in the database, but not available for staff to edit. There is a patch out there on the Git repo right now to make this available for staff to edit with permissions. I know because I wrote it. Um, photo URLs can be very identifying. They can contain visual data about a patron. And alert messages. Free text fields are scary. Now, alert messages have largely been superseded by notes and messages now uh, and are harder to get to in the modern OPAC. But sometimes that just means you have personally identifying information in there that nobody's looking at, but is still accessible indirectly. So it is something to think about. What can you do about all this? Well, you can evaluate what you store and how, and you have to approach that from a standpoint of staff training. You know, what gets stored? Is it okay for a staff member to say in a note, this patron is really stinky and I hate him. And by the way, he lives at blah, 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 blah. Not where he claims. There's at least one, if not two or three things in that example that we probably don't actually want in a note. So that is a component, staff training, saying what you want to have in those free text fields. And then you need to ask yourselves those questions. Like, do you need birth dates? Instinctively, birth dates seem to be this piece of data that libraries instinctively gravitate to grabbing. But do we actually need it? Do you actually base any services off it? Maybe you do. Statistics, you say? Well, Brad said it in chat. I have it here on the slide as well. Um, but do you need the actual birth date for age groups? What about just the year they were born in? Or the decade? How granular do you need it? Um, I do tell people that digital archaeology is a good thing to start practicing. Uh, Stuart in chat said year of birth might work. Uh, yeah, I mean, put everybody in as January 1st of that year, if all you need is the year. If all you need is the decade, January 1st, start of the decade, 1970, 1980, 1990. Ask yourself how granular you need it.
Right. Uh, Jonathan mentions in chat that you need to put a date in, but you can make up the date. Uh, and I think there are some options uh, for that, but we can look. I don't think you have to set the birth date as required. I'm pretty sure there's an option to control that. Um, but somebody else in chat can mention that. Uh, who might know better off the top of their head than I do. But you can put in fake dates. I mean, if you're not going to collect birth dates and you're in a governing group where they've decided, to, say, on a consortial level to require birth dates, but your organization doesn't need them, put in January the 1st, 1900 for all of them. If you only need the year, January 1st that year. I mean, there are ways to make this work. Yeah, Tammy mentioned that she does not have the birthdays required. That's what I thought. Yeah. Yes, and uh, Bradley mentions uh, fake 1900 birth year. I, I will tell you when I migrate data and I'm migrating birth dates, they often don't exist, but I may be migrating them into a system where they require them. So they will come up as a bad record and cause problems. I'll often fill in a fake birth date. And I often use January 1st, 1900 for that reason. Because then it's all easy to look at and say, ah, that's probably a fake one. That's one that was filled in, not real. But it's good to do some digital archaeology. It's good to look at what you have in the system. And even if it was collected for a good reason at one point, do you still want it or can you get rid of it? And stuff, you know, frankly, sometimes it's come through multiple ILSs. I've done migrations of libraries that have had five ILSs and have weird stuff that the library had no idea was in there. Okay, so discussion time. I thought this would be a fun, quick one, but what have you seen in a library system? It doesn't have to be your ILS. It could be uh, some other form of digital archive, newspaper clippings database, you know, an image archive, whatever, that you've had to remove and clean out. What scares you that might be hiding in records? Social security numbers. Oh, social security numbers. Yes. Jessica has that as well. <laughs> and where they don't conform to standard expectations for format, oh. you have to really dig for them. Yep. Uh, Stuart says comment fields. Yeah. Yeah. I live in terror at free text fields. Um, and, and this is not on topic, but if you do anything in text fields, and you put line breaks in, you're a bad person. <laughs> and you are making life harder for somebody like me in the future. John says cleaning up social security numbers and driver's license numbers. Yeah, driver's license numbers. I don't know that it's illegal in Indiana yet, but we are highly encouraging all of our libraries to remove those as yeah. well. And just straight out strip the social security numbers. That's, yeah. Yeah. Alt codes for invisible spaces. Oh, that's so gross. Yeah. That, that's a terrible person right there. Yeah. Um, and, and alert messages too. That's my, that is my personal pet oh, peeve is alert and, messages. And we will be getting to that in a second. That's on oh. a slide. <laughs> I don't have so, a field. So anyway. <laughs> so I have several of these. Uh, so we're all good now, right? If we clean all that stuff up. Well, no, there's other stuff in actor you have to look at. Uh, some people are surprised when I mention that you need to look at barcodes, but barcodes can be identifying in some cases, especially if the mirroring usernames. I mean, if you have a name, if you have a username of Jane.do, and then that's also used as their barcode, guess what? Addresses. I mean, there's very little more identifying than an address. And so much more, so much more. So all of this is stuff you need to look at also and ask if you need it. Now, most libraries probably do have a legitimate need for addresses. But again, ask yourself if you do. Now, statistical categories. This is something not everybody talks about. But statistical categories also can be filled with personally identifying information. They're just plain dangerous. But you might need them. I very commonly see patron types in them gender in them, I mentioned this earlier, age groups, school districts, which I misspelled district there, I'll fix that before I print this, municipalities, and those are all things that can be potentially identifying. And 
are dangerous. Now, note I don't call them bad. And I don't call them bad for a reason. There's things you need to look at and consider. But the th same things can be good sometimes. I mean, let's look at that. Uh, patron types and gender, we've already talked about. I think they're pretty straightforward. But age groups. We talked earlier about statistical need for... If you turn off requiring birth dates, you can just have the age groups you need and keep them as statistical categories. School district. Maybe you don't need addresses for them, but you do need school districts for students. And you can track that that way. Or a municipality. You know, maybe the area of a city or the neighborhood they live in is adequate for your needs. I mean, I will go and tell you, I, I am highly doubtful about the value of addresses often. Do you know, I, mean, I cannot begin to tell you the number of times I have looked at a list of patrons with fines and they have not lived there in years and years. They do not are not at that phone number we have for them. And if we're gonna find them, it requires investigation. You know, we're more likely to be able to use an electronic phone book to find them than a library record. So I, I sincerely question the value of keeping some of this stuff. User activity. A lot of people aren't even familiar with the user activity table in the database, but you can define activity types and there are pre-existing default ones and patrons are linked to them with dates. So you can see things that patrons have done. And certainly personally identifying. More free text fields. We already mentioned this briefly, but messages and notes. I live in terror of free text fields and what's in them and what has to be parsed out of them. So, yeah, they're a danger. Family relationships. Now, I know we're supposed to live in the age of linked data and everything having being connected to everything else is supposed to be great. But we have privacy waivers in Evergreen now where it says... This patron can, can create a transaction for another patron and they're linked. We have the ability to link families and groups, guardian information. All of this is potentially identifying by giving a data point of linking patrons together and are things that we need to watch out for. All right, we're back to the frustration level. We're done, right? There's nothing else. What do people think? something else. There's more. There actually is. Now, in the action schema, we have some pretty big things. Uh, the action schema tracks what people do rather than who they are in theory. It, we'll see some exceptions to that. Here. The two big ones are holds and circulations. Those are stored in the action schema. Going back to PII, it's information both about who you are and what you do. Holds and circulations are certainly things people do and that people may have very legitimate reasons to want to keep private. But there are some other things you may not suspect, like curbside. We now have a curbside table in the system that will store information about how a staff member can identify you when they come out to bring you your stuff. So people very reasonably put in it things like, Oh, I'm driving a white hatchback. Uh, here's the year in make. Here's my driver's license. I mean, here's my license plate number and this kind of stuff. How many people thought about curbside data as a potential privacy point? Your circulation history. That's stored distinctly if you're opted into it. Surveys. Surveys aren't heavily used in Evergreen, in my experience, but they exist. And who knows what's in them? Whatever a survey was created for. So that certainly can be a concern and something that needs to be evaluated, both for should it be used and should it be retained. So is there a lesson in all this? Well, yeah, there is such a thing as healthy paranoia. Look at everything. Uh, and all of this goes back to some of those same questions that ALA proposed when designing a privacy policy. Uh, I'm not super pro ALA myself. I, I have 
many criticisms of the organization. Uh, but but I do think that's a useful starting document. And it does communicate the message that this is about asking questions. Now, what can you do about all this stuff? Well, the good news is that it's pretty straightforward. One, staff education, which we talked about. Now, I'm not going to belabor that point. Two is you can create a policy for removing inactive patrons. You can define this however you want. These patrons haven't had a hold or a circulation in X number of years. Now, you need to be careful. Perhaps they're only using electronic resources. So you may want to create some way to track, you know, that they're being validated in other ways or create maybe a statistical category for them. Uh, get reports from your service like Overdrive or Access 360 or whatever and use that to set statistical categories for the patrons. Um, so be careful that, you know, even if they don't have transactions in Evergreen, they may be authenticated against Evergreen and still active patrons in other ways. But yeah, and using authentication activity is certainly valid. Bradley mentioned that in, tech, in chat. But remove the active patrons. They don't owe you fines, or maybe they don't owe you much. You know, hey, every patron that hasn't been active in the last five years and owes less than 10 bucks, get rid of them. I probably would actually be more generous than that for the fines, but I, I'm pretty skeptical about reco fine recovery, personally. Um, and then age circulations and holds. Now, removing inactive patrons is something that you have to do one at a time in the staff client, but it's easy for support staff to do it on the back end if you can give them the list of IDs uh, or give them very clear criteria for generating those reports. And aging circulations and holds is something that is natively supported in Evergreen. You can set it up to wipe out this information historically once the circulations are closed and the holds are completed. And I certainly think that's something people should consider doing. Now, it does keep statistical information, so that can be useful. Uh, review old content for removal. Yeah, if you're not going to delete the page, remove inactive patrons, still look at what you don't need. That patron hasn't been there for five years. What's the statistical likelihood of their phone number or address still being good? What about at 10 years, 15 years? You've chosen not to remove patrons, but can you remove that information? These are good questions to ask. I'll be curious to the answer of Jessica's question in chat also about consortia doing privacy workshops. Um, and I don't know if anybody would want to use any of the information off my slides, but I'll mention that since we already talked about them being posted to the website, they will be posted under a Creative Commons license so that people can freely use content from them, if they wish. Now, I am going to mention, while we're talking about aging transactions, that they can be de-anonymized. De and there is a bug out there for that. It's Launchpad bug 1861239. There is some back and forth on this bug. I welcome people to comment on it. Um, I, I won't beat the drum too much here. I do have an opinion on this bug, and I wrote it in the bug. So people can see what I think there. I would really like to get this patched. <laughs> uh, and basically it provides an option for no longer keeping postcode and birth date if you set that as an org unit setting uh, for a library. By default right now we do. I think that potentially overreach um, and the disagreement on the bug is about whether or not the default should be to not and have it turned on or vice versa. In a perfect security world, it should be opt-in and not kept by default. But I also believe in the principle of least disturbance for systems. And there are some systems like Indiana, as I understand it, where they need that for statistics. And I would really hate for somebody to miss that when doing an upgrade and then some them to lose critical information they need for their statistics. So. Feel free to go add heat and discuss this. <laughs> but community-wise, what can we do? Uh, we have that patron purge function. It is really critical to patron privacy. And if libraries are purging inactive patrons, it's really critical that it works very thoroughly. 
obviously we've talked about a lot of places in both the actor and action schema that information can be potentially stored. So I think it would be nice at some point to do a review of the purge patron function and make sure there are no bugs in it in terms of missing things. You know, for example, I don't know off the top of my head, does it wipe the informational uh, note free text field from curbside? I don't know. Those would be good things to check in my opinion. I think we should also consider tools for removing old data points. You know, we, we have these great uh, utility scripts for aging transactions, certs and holds, and I think that's great. Wouldn't it be great to also have similar tools to say, hey, um, I'm going to pick on curbside again just because it's already, you know, something I'm thinking about. But these curbside appointments were are done. They're not coming back. We're going to, you know, remove unnecessary information from them. I, I think a full audit of options for those sorts of things would be nice. Now we're going to move on to the single biggest potential threat to privacy in the system. And that is what is in front of you, reports. Reports are terrifying. I, I thought about putting a graphic in here as an in-between slide and everything I thought of that I thought was scary enough to represent reports, I thought might genuinely disturb people watching the presentation. I don't know. All those unnamed folders right there are pretty terrifying to me. <laughs> well, I wiped those out because they In had names associated. Oh, okay. okay. I was like, how do you find anything, Rogan? But that makes more sense. Okay. Yeah, those had names associated with users, and Valid. I didn't feel it necessary to uh, uh, add them to the presentation. You anonymized them. Yep. Um, the only names visible here are basically mine and another employee at Equinox, Jennifer. Um, so yeah, reports are terrifying. I mean, I thought about putting like a slide here of like clowns and spiders. Um, so why are reports so scary? Reports are scary because they're a fire hose. Um, you could do a report that says, give me all the phone numbers and all the address and all the names and all the emails of every patron in the system and just dump it. Give me all their circulations. Give me all their holds. They're probably going to want to break that up into multiple reports, but you can do it. And managing that are just these permissions. That's it. Run reports, share a folder, view output, and create a report. It's not very granular. If a user needs to see the patrons and be able to run reports on them for a bookmobile, they can also get all the information for all juveniles in the system and adults and anything else. If they need to be able to run a CERC report, they can also run reports with statistical category and address data. So that is a big opening that anybody can freely walk through. And yeah, hello darkness, my old friend. I'm not gonna try to sing Simon and Garfunkel because nobody wants to hear me try to sing at all. Have it playing in our head now. Yeah, that's actually my favorite Simon and Garfunkel song. Yeah. Um, anyway, so what can you do about that? Well, even though reports are a big open security risk, you can restrict those to who need it the most. You can go back to beating that drum of staff education. You can remind the people with the report's permission that they have been given a big trust and they need to be careful. They need to not save patron reports with tons of information on thumb drives and lose them at the local park uh, in CSV format. Um, and if they don't, they'll be doing better than some members of the CIA, which have, you know, lost unencrypted laptops with secure information in public forms. Um, <laughs> but as always, just like in the CIA, and I don't think the CIA gets compared to libraries very often, but like the CIA, our biggest security hole in libraries is 
not bad actors, but people doing their jobs, acting in good faith, and making mistakes, and probably having more access than they should. Uh, so what can we do about that? Well, we can create policies. We can say you can't take this information out of the library. Don't send it in emails. Not sending information in emails is a really good start. Because once you send it in an email, it's on some server somewhere for a long time and hard to get to. Uh, Google, if you have Google Gmail as your library mail and you send an attachment, you can probably never get rid of it. So... Think about how you store report output, how it's distributed and used. Community-wide, and I'm going to say up front, this is my personal opinion incoming. It does not reflect Equinox, the Open Library Initiative in any way, shape, or form. It's just my thought. I'd love to see us look at options for restricting reports by content per user. Now, I'm going to go and throw out. This would be a big change. This wouldn't be easy. wouldn't be quick. It take a lot of thinking before we even start talking about code, about how it would work. But I think it is something we should think about. But it is a very big picture thing. So finally, we're done, right? We've covered everything. Not quite. If you want to imagine the uh, the sad trombone sound playing now, you can do that. <laughs> because there are some other things you sh should consider. Outputs and backups. Action triggers, we love action triggers, right? They allow us to do things like generate XML data for notices. Well, any data for notices. But then that's living in an action trigger table. This person checked this book out on this date, is due at this date. That's living in a whole other place that's not directly connected to a user. Report output. It exists on a server. It may exist in some on somebody's hard drive or solid state drive or network drive or whatever. We have auditor tables in Evergreen. If you're auditing, for example, actor.user, you may have not only information about that user, but every change that's happened to their account. And that's something you need to think about. Data backups. You may be running replication, in which case you can probably consider all the versions running as the same for intents and purposes, but there's a very good chance that you have some sort of actual backup somewhere, perhaps even on you know a separate server that you use as backup. Um, if you have governance rules that require you actually have cold storage at certain intervals, you may have that. And these should be reflected in your policy, you know that they will be removed at some point and reflect patrons that have been removed and things like that. And then offline transactions. This patron was created. This patron checked this book out, put this on hold. That ends up in a JSON file that sits on the server and should be cleaned out periodically. So finally, we're done, right? That's everything. We have missed nothing. Sad trombone again. This is my last one, the OPAC. Remember when we talked about interactive OPACs as an emerging technology? Well, I thought it was kind of funny. I still do. But it is a legitimate point that OPACs contain patron information. And often, we create the problem because we install things like Google tracking. And let me go ahead and tell you, I don't care if you close down your Google account. Google still has that information somewhere. So we're creating that problem. But we often need analytics. And I, I really do think libraries should consider uh, using something like Matomo, which is very easy to use in Evergreen now. Now, it does require an external service. You might have to set up your own server or use a service provider for it. But as of 3.6, using it with Evergreen is as simple as turning on a few uh, org unit settings. And then you're not giving out that use data to anyone else, including the originating IPs, which in the age of cable modems are pretty identifying in their own right. I mean, I can go ahead and tell you, uh, I have a cable modem here at home and my IP has not changed in years. And that's common these days. 
So there we go. And that brings us with 15 minutes to go. Our time for general discussion, questions. Uh, Ruth, feel free to, you know, add people in for yeah. voice chat. Um, and thank, if people don't have any discussion points, thank you for having me. So Chris has a question about cookies and caching data. He says, what about it? Uh, <laughs> but obviously we have to do it. I mean, our, our websites need to use cookies and need to cache data in order for web apps to be functional. Um, but we shouldn't be too aggressive about it. And I don't think Evergreen is horribly aggressive about it. Uh, it, it is a difficult point though when we, I mean, frankly, I mean, we've taken this thing that was meant to serve up static documents and then built it up into an application layer provider over the decades. Um, we may have to decide to live with some necessary evils there at times. Uh, so there is a, another comment here from Jonathan and this is, goes back to the outputs. Remember to delete your old reports. And I will yes. tell you, I was the guilty one about this because I was sure that I was going to go back in there and look at those things for trends and things. And I, I don't think I had patron data ones, but I would, I, I could have very easily been this person. Uh, Jessica's, I'm shook by email and reports. Never thought about that. I can't imagine transitioning away from that. Yeah. I'm also well, there with that. It, it depends a little bit on what reports. I mean, yeah. let's keep in mind, not all information is PII. Um, right. You know, if you're emailing stuff about collections and copies by shelving location and status, who cares? Mm -hmm. that, that's not hurting anybody. I, I don't consider, you know, information about bibs and copies to be, you know, sensitive. But if it's a report about patrons, I mean, if it's cumulative numbers, eh, whatever, I'll email it. Right. If there's anything identifying that goes on a server that I require access to, and then the file is deleted after it's pulled. I'm going to get so. back to, to Bradley's right here, because I think that it's going to get a little in-depth there after a second. So Jonathan says using encryption for sensitive reports. Yes. Uh, Bradley says uh, using a cron job to delete old reports is handy. Yes. Yep. Uh, and plain text SIP. Now I'm going to go back I, to the. I I'm, I I would I did not plan on talking about SIP today. Uh, I my presentation tomorrow uh, actually touches on this issue, but yeah, plain text SIP is a major privacy security issue. So that's going to um, lead right into this bigger thing from Bradley that says thoughts on third party vendors, discovery yeah. layers, e vendors. Right. Etc. with authentication with us and more, which is right. something we are dealing with hardcore in Evergreen, Indiana right now. Yeah, th this touches on a lot of topics I'm going to talk about tomorrow in my presentation on how to connect to external services. Uh, so I will go ahead and sort of uh, plug your draw. program. Yeah. yeah, I'll plug on that a little bit. I will say SIP2 is this dinosaur it is like the dinosaurs, you mm -hmm. know, it is ancient, it is unwieldy, it is probably bad for the, you know, it just, <laughs> it, it, it deserved to die out, but we still occasionally find some dinosaur fish alive in some deep lake or deep trenches of the ocean. Uh, Cause they, we just find it hard to get rid of them. And SIP is like that. Um, I do recommend to people that because SIP is the lingua franca of the library world and so heavily used that they encrypt it put it in an encrypted tunnel uh if your vendor doesn't support encrypted tunnel tunneling for sip they should pressure them <laughs> pressure um, them and let's talk about an api but yeah, I, <laughs> but not right and, now <laughs> and and yes it would be nice for alternatives to sip to be more widely used but they're not mm -hmm. um I will tell you that Equinox, uh, I can't speak for anybody else, Equinox does provide supported encrypted tunneling for SIP for anybody who asks for it. That's cool. Um, uh, Let me go back and see if there's anything here that I missed. Yeah. I do want to make note that Bradley also said to rename the user interface labels for reports to clowns and spiders. I, I, I'm cool with that. I fully support that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
third party vendors, discovery layers, all that. It, again, it disp discovery layers, I don't generally consider very uh, worrisome. And again, I'm going to talk about that tomorrow and connecting to external Fantastic. services. Fantastic, yeah. Because I, um, I didn't to hear about that. Authentication gets into SIP2. Uh, you know what? I'm just going to say, listen, come to my talk tomorrow for <laughs> that. Yeah, that's legit. Anything I didn't else? consider these two complementary of each other, but I guess they kind of are. But they, yeah, they they are definitely complementary, and lead one right into the other, obviously. But yeah, I'll be talking tomorrow about a number of options uh, for connecting to Evergreen to pull information, especially for non-sensitive uh, purposes. And that is tomorrow. Do you have offhand what time that's at? I want to hold on. I can tell you. I know. I'm looking now. right at it. But I'm. Uh, oh, it's at one o'clock uh, yeah. Eastern time. Connecting Evergreen to external services. So uh, yeah. was that ten o'clock Pacific time? That no. should be ten o'clock Pacific time, I believe. Patron API exists in Evergreen too. Yeah. Um, sort of. It depends on what you mean by API. I'm going to talk about that tomorrow too. Well, yeah, I was going to say specifically that that feature called Patron API. I think is a is it a triple I thing? Right. Well, yeah. Kind of. Yeah. Okay, you're going to talk about it. Uh, we'll just talk about it yet tomorrow. Well, I, a small spoiler. Um, I mean, there is the triple I product. Uh, I, I took Chris's comments in a different direction. Oh, okay. Um, there, you know, there's a difference between what API technically means and how people tend to very casually use it. And they, and when you're talking to a vendor, um, and they, oftentimes I hate to say it, but vendors. Depends on the vendor. Well, and you're often talking to salespeople yep. who are repeating things and they themselves don't really know what they're saying. And they just want and, all your data and they want to get all of it now. Well, the salesperson just wants to close the contract. Right. Well, of course. Then yeah. it's somebody else's problem. <laughs> so how long are you going to talk about this for three hours? Is that what it's on the schedule for? I'm going to do it in about 50 minutes. <laughs> Dang it. Okay, cool. Very uh, briefly. Brad says, also vendors, we need local admin uh, access to everything because we do. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, no, exactly the thing. No, and it's no, a hard pass. No. Bless your, um, your pretty little hearts. But I no. am going to discuss tomorrow briefly. I'll talk about database access. Yes. Uh, uh, Yay. Yeah. Thank you. Obviously, this is an issue near and dear to my heart. I could go on, but I'm not. I'm not gonna. Anybody else have any questions for Rogan? You have it exactly for seven more minutes. Yep, seven minutes. Yeah, I will go ahead and I, I will uh, sort of sell it a little bit to people who might be interested. The presentation tomorrow on connecting external services does get into some techie bits, but it is not a presentation for developers. Um, it is not a super techie presentation. It is a presentation for essentially two groups of librarians. Mm -hmm. uh, either I'm the librarian who is least afraid of technology at my library, and therefore they have me always talk to other people for its stuff. Or, you know, yeah, I'm a systems librarian, mm -hmm. but I'm supporting 30 different things. Right. No, I don't have time to you know, become a developer for Evergreen, even though I might want to, I probably don't have that time. Um, and these are the audiences for the presentation tomorrow. And can I expand on your audience for that? Because sure. I am thinking specifically of um, another group. And this is, I'm going to just say, use the broad term public services librarians who believe that their consortial administrators can do everything. <laughs> and uh, the, I do think that this conversation with Rogan tomorrow can help provide some context for yeah. a, what is technically um, possible and what is ethically going to happen and also the kind of in-betweens for that and provide some context for having those conversations with the vendors um, who use a lot of technical speak to um, basically convince you that they know what they're talking about, so you should do what they say. And, and, it's, and it's often coming from people who don't actually know. What of course, no, about. they're just <laughs> super confident with words. And right. so I think that the, the, what you're going to talk about will provide some vocabulary context as well. So, yeah. uh, and, and I will tell you, there are sort of two things that prompted me to think about uh, doing that presentation. One is I was working with uh, 
one of our libraries who was setting up an external service and the external service kept uh, pushing back that Evergreen needed to change things. Evergreen needed to do this. Evergreen needed to do that. I know what you're talking and, about. And I had to have a conversation with the library and say, look, um, all Evergreen is doing is saying whether or not that patron exists and the password is real. All the stuff that's not working is their stuff. Um, <laughs> we got no control over that. Um, and I'm not going to say more than that because I don't want to, you know, de-anonymize to the that. vendor. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and the other was uh, uh, another interaction, and I've had many interactions like this, where the vendor just kind of said, oh, well, just, you know, have them give us their API docs. <laughs> and, it, you know, it's a salesperson saying this. Mm -hmm. Just give us the APIs. And it's like, and, you know, I'm trying to explain to the librarian, they don't mean what they're saying. No. Because Evergreen, and, and so we'll talk about all that tomorrow. Yep, so we'll talk. Cool. Thank you. Last call, four minutes. And I think we have coming up after me, uh, I think it's an ASCII doc in Antora. It so. is indeed with Lynn from Evergreen, Indiana, and Blake mm -hmm. from Mobius. So for you docs people, that's going to be a must-have sort of session. So. And then Chris is going to be over in track one. Or what, what track are we in? We're track, track two. He'll track be in two, track two. And he's doing making the most of evergreen reports. Yeah. And I think that will, Chris has done this many times. He's very good at it. He knows it very well. So for those interested in reports, I definitely would check that out. Spider whisperer. <laughs> yep. Chris is the spider whisperer. That needs to become a and, thing. And from he now needs on. to be told that. Yep. <laughs> well, should we provide him with context what it means? Only after you tell them. Oh, fair. Okay. Cool. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Well, thank you, Rogan. I really enjoyed the, what you brought. I learned a lot. I hope that others did as well. And Great. well, everybody have a good day and have a good conference. Yeah. Let the next group start. <laughs>